right, we've got some excellent arthroscopists in, uh, amongst us, but uh, I'm afraid even they are not going to be repair all your tears. So we'll get I think some. We, we, we know you're one of the largest series we, on graft we jacket. Will, we will do some proper surgery you now. We know your largest series on the graft jacket, your commendable work. Okay, so that's your problem. You've got a massive tear in a not so elderly gentleman with uh, retraction beyond the joint line. You've got uh, no cuff posterior, nothing superior, fatty changes. And we know from the natural history, tears will propagate. At how many of them will propagate and how many will uh, develop cuff tear arthropathy is difficult to tell. But they're never going to repair and uh, tears which are not repaired will become fatty and these changes are reversible. So when you can't repair it, you come into this augment territory. And there are different augments. Most of them have failed. And uh, what I'm going to talk about is the human dermal allograft. And that's where the graft jacket is. So this is harvested from human cadaveric skin. And it's uh, processed in a patented technology to remove all the cells. So it relieves you with a scaffold, which is of proteoglycans and uh, collagen. Hopefully, all the vascular channels are all intact. So your host tissue will hopefully grow into this. So this is more of a biological repair as compared to a superior capsular reconstruction where you are putting dead tissue, which is, uh, you know, there's no, there's no potential for growth, you know, ingrowth in there over there. So this is a sort of typical patient. You've got a massive tear, retraction way beyond the joint line. You can see there's a lot of fatty atrophy. And uh, I'll just play the video now. Okay, so this is done in the standard beach chair position with the standard McKenzie and advisor approach. So you raise some skin flaps. Oops. So the next step crucial when you're doing any open procedure by the Navaz uh, technique is uh, you take some osteoperiosteal flaps off uh, with the anterior deltoid. And it's absolutely mandatory that you repair these with transosseous sutures at the end. Because the worst thing you can have with any open surgery is a deltoid dehiscence. Because once you get it, there's absolutely no way you're going to be able to set that right. So once you have done that, uh, you do your uh, acromioplasty. And once you've done your acromioplasty, you've seen you, there's a massive tear with a bald head. Now at this stage, it is quite important you identify what is bursal tissue and where is the cuff edge. Okay, because the bursa can be extremely hypertrophied and uh, when you start off, you may actually mistake that for the cuff edge. So once you have uh, resected the bursa, then you start uh, placing your uh, stay sutures. You can work either in the front at the first or at the back. So. Once you, you place your sutures outside in, so they're already pre-placed when you have to attach your graft. So once you've placed your first suture, you use that, take some traction, so it delivers the next part of the tendon, and you work your way all the way to the apex. Now sometimes you do have an apex, and sometimes there's just a C-shaped diffused apex. So if you do have an apex, it is possible to reduce the size of the tear to some extent with a margin convergence. So once you have done that, then you go to the posterior bit and take your posterior stay sutures in the cuff. Now this is probably the most uh, difficult portion because the posterior cuff is subluxed posteriorly inferiorly. And getting access to the medial part is quite difficult. But now that uh, if you can use your uh, arthroscopic suture passes, uh, this sort of reduces uh, your operative time as well. Then you next prepare your footprint, keep it ready. And uh, you have already decided your tear is not going to be repairable, so you have already taken your graft jacket. You need to pre-soak it for about 10 minutes. Okay, so once your footprint is prepared, you need to shape your graft. 
This graft is, uh, comes in different thicknesses. What we use is the max force, and uh, this is seven by four millimeters, seven by four centimeters in size. So depending on uh, your size of the defect you are bridging, uh, you need to shape your thing. Now if it's uh, between a three and a half to four uh, centimeter defect, I've tended to double the graft. So I've been doing that for the last three, four years now. And the first stitch which you take is your pikel stitch. So where your apex is, uh, you anchor your graft. Then you have already placed, pre-placed your anterior sutures. The sutures should be about a centimeter apart. Now, you know, though the footprint you saw was very large, you rarely need to use more than one or two anchors because uh, it comes in a V-shaped, as it comes anteriorly, you can get most of it covered with the graft with the tendon tissue, which you'll see in, uh, later. So you do exactly the same with the posterior bit. Your pre-placed sutures uh, going through the graft edge. And then you put your anchors. I mean, we started off uh, with peak anchors. Now we use uh, bio knotless, uh, so sorry, we use the knotless all suture anchors, uh, the juggernaut. And more often, sometimes don't use anchors at all, just use transosseous sutures. Okay, so, so you anchor the foot into the footprint, the edge, and you don't resect the graft till this is all done. And then whatever is excess, you can uh, excise it. <coughs> okay, so that's the excess graft which is being excised. Now, as I said, this is a seven by five, seven by four centimeter graft, and uh, you can see this is about two centimeters. So I've actually covered a defect by four by five centimeters. So it's, a, it's a large defect, really. And this is what I call as uh, window dressing, where I tend to cover the edge with the bursal tissue, so it just gives a smooth edge. It's not necessarily to do this, but uh, I've been tending to do this. Okay, sorry. So that is, uh, he's actually an anesthetist. Yeah. Actually, I need to go back. So that's the size of the defect. You can see the bald head is completely covered with your graft. So it's a sizable defect, but each edge is repaired to the edge of the tendon. So what you are going to get over here is tissue in growth, hopefully, from the cuff edge. And uh, whether this works in reality or not, I will let you know in a minute as well. So this is my anesthetist, actually, who had a massive cuff tear. It was the scan I showed you pre-operatively. And uh, you can see he's got a near full function at, uh, at six months. His Oxford score has improved from 22 to 43. He's back to doing everything. And that is his graph, uh, his scan. So you can see pre-operatively, massive tear at one year post-op. You can see the graft, which is in continuity. You can see it on the sagittals as well as bridging all the way across. I've had the opportunity to scope about three or four of them for various reasons and uh, taken some histology, some biopsies as well. And you can see over here at the top is the graft, which is completely, you know, it appears as one continuous structure. That is the edge of the graft and the tendon. You can actually see the anchors over here. And you've got a little tear in the graft, which I had to repair arthroscopically. And the histology, all these little purple dots, which you see over here, that my pathologist in sort of assures me that is all host tissue 
which is actually grown into the graft. So this actually works in a biological fashion. So we did present our four-year uh, uh, results earlier, and uh, that's a, quite a while ago now. And we looked at our first 61 cases, and uh, you know the average uh, defect bridge was about 4.2 centimeters with uh, tear size about 5, 5 centimeters, really. And you see there's a substantial increase in the range of movement. You gain about 50, 60 degrees of elevation abduction. Your pain scores come down to less than one. I think that is the most consistent thing. What they don't get back is the strength. And uh, you know, with Mr. Pandey, we have compared the results with partial tears. Uh, the graph jacket is superior, and the results seem to be sustained over a period of time. The ones who do well at one year, they seem to be going on uh, for a prolonged period of time. And recently looked at the graph jackets in over 70s. You know, in this cohort, we have had about 11 patients. And again, they start off with a lesser Oxford score, but even they tend to do well, which could be an alternative to, to, to doing a reverse arthroplasty. So now in Leicester, in nine years, we have done over 300 cases. Uh, we have presented a two to four year follow-up, which has been very, very encouraging. And hopefully in the next six months, we aim to follow the same cohort of the first 61 patients and give you the six to eight year follow-up results. So I think in, to summarize, I think it is a, a very, very good option to other alternatives which you have at this stage. You know, your, your tendon transfers is not without any morbidity, and I have reservations about the superior capsular reconstruction because at the end of the day, I look at it as like an upside down trampoline with your head, humeral head just bouncing against it. So there's no biology in there, so it's, it's a matter of time before that gives away. And it could be an alternative to even elderly patients who do not have arthropathy, do not have arthritis, and uh, you could probably consider a graft jacket in those as well. Thank you very much.